Hi, hi there. I'm Will Trackman, General Counsel of Mountain States Legal Foundation. Welcome to our September webinar uh, in our So a Neighbor Asked series. This month's webinar is called So a Neighbor Asked, Why is the Federal Government Obsessed with DEI, or Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Programs? Uh, we have two very uh, August guests with us here today uh, that I'm going to introduce them. We're going to talk a little bit about our topic, and then at the end, uh, we'll take Q&A from our audience. We're probably going to go about 45 to 50 minutes today, so keep those questions in mind. There is a Q&A box on your screen right now, so there's no need to wait until the Q&A session to ask your question. You can drop it in the box anytime. So with that, let me introduce first May Mailman, who is the director of the Independent Women's Forum, Independent Women's Forum Legal Center, the previous Deputy Solicitor General of Ohio, and former staffer in the Chief of Staff's Office in President Trump's White House, uh, also a former big law uh, attorney. We also have Braden Busek, the Vice President of Litigation at the Southeastern Legal Foundation, uh, who previously worked at the Beacon Center. Uh, Southeastern Legal and Mountain States have worked on a number of cases together uh, on the DEI issue and are currently co-counsel uh, on the Strickland matter in Texas and the Holman matter in Tennessee, which I'm sure Braden will have a chance to talk about. And uh, the Independent Women's Forum Legal Center and Mountain State Serco Council in our Secret Service matter, where we're seeking uh, to investigate the Secret Service over their sex discrimination practices. With that, let's get right into it. Um, the first thing I'll ask to both of our panelists, um, May, you're welcome to take this first, is what trends are you seeing in terms of the broadest picture about the government, the federal government, trying to embrace uh, either race or sex or other DEI concepts into its hiring or programming? Are you seeing anything on the ground from your perspective? Yeah, so it's funny, I think, because if you talk about profit, for-profit organizations, there's been a narrative that companies are moving away from some of the DEI madness that a lot of the uh, DEI officers are losing their positions or leaving and not being rehired. And, you know, I think we'll see whether that's actually a trend or whether that was recessionary and it'll be back as soon as companies have a few more dollars to throw at it. But since the government is recession proof, they can just keep printing more money. Uh, that trend has not hit the federal government. Uh, Obama really started it and created an executive order where he mandated that federal contractors have affirmative of action programs, which where are you getting that authority? I have, uh, you know, not from law or the Constitution, but apparently uh, that's a priority that that withstood uh, any sort of, I guess, challenge that doesn't. Yeah, federal contractor mandates have been challenged in a sort of a lot of areas, and they've they've been able to continue. So, if you look at the Biden Harris administration's Office of Personnel Management, I think they've doubled and tripled down on DEI, including for transgender status, women, uh, BIPOC, like whatever category you would like. Um, but what's remarkable is what has happened with, with this focus. And I found it pretty funny that on the last equal pay day, the Biden-Harris administration had a greater pay gap for women and men ah. than the not like than sort of private employers than the public. So they've done, you know, they pay a lot of lip service to caring about all sorts of aggrieved populations, but even by their own statistics. Uh, they're not valuing uh, women to to that degree. Of course, we don't really believe in the pay gap being indicative of discrimination. There's a lot of reasons why women might take a job that pays less because it gives them more flexibility. Um, but anyway, I think, uh, Will, to your question of what have we seen, we've seen a, a Supreme Court justice uh, come as a result of Biden saying he will only look at Black women to be put on the Supreme Court. Um, and from that decision all the way down, um, there's there has been no retreat. I mean, you mentioned President Obama, who famously said he had a phone and a pen for anything he couldn't get through Congress. He was just going to issue executive orders and call his agencies to make changes. So I suppose no surprise that 
that filter down throughout the entirety of the executive branch. Uh, Braden uh, may mention the private sector may be backing away from DEI um, and also that the Biden administration has embraced this even more so than we thought was possible after President Obama. In your world, what trends are you seeing and and what is your your hottest take in terms of um, the federal government uh, embracing DEI? Right. That was a good summary of what's going on in the private sector. Um, I'll just add uh, that there was a McKinsey study that came out in January of 2023 that said the glo- DEI spending was $7.5 billion in 2020, and it's estimated to more than double to $15.4 billion in 2026. So at least McKinsey doesn't think that uh, these sorts of programs are going to be slowing down in the near future. In fact, it's estimating and planning on the fact that they're going to accelerate. But, you know, it, it, it may be a terrible idea for private uh, sector employees to be implementing these DEI initiatives, depending on what they are. It may even, in some cases, violate federal civil rights laws. But when it comes to um, the government pushing this in government programming or government employment, it implicates a whole host of constitutional considerations. Specifically, uh, the Fifth Amendment requires that all Americans be treated equally. The 14th Amendment requires that all states and local governments treat people equally. And combined, uh, that guarantees all Americans uh, equality from their government. And equality in the constitutional sense means colorblindness. It means not treating people differently based on race and sex. And, um, you know, DEI very much lurks uh, behind a fog of euphemisms. But once you penetrate it and uh, ascertain its true meaning, in many ways, it absolutely rejects color blindness and equality because equity, the term, the E, the uh, DEI, uh, means equality of outcomes. So it means looking at people as a group rather than an individual. And it means ensuring that the government treats some people within a particular group differently than other groups so as to ensure equality of outcomes. And in that sense, it sacrifices equality upon the altar of equity. Um, It's not just a bad idea like it might be for private employers. It's a constitutional requirement. Um, And unfortunately, we have... uh, various arms of government um, totally at war with this concept. As you know, Will, uh, when the administration flopped over, um, one of the first priorities was issuing an equity throughout whole of government approach. That was just a policy preference, but um, that was eagerly received by the federal bureaucracy. And those various federal bureaucracies are continuing to be busy at work uh, endeavoring to ensure their peculiar definitions of equity, regardless of um, how it affects the constitutional requirement of equality. I mean, I know you know some of our cases, you're on some of these cases, but in a variety of both congressionally required programs, um, the the uh, federal government is treating people differently based on their race, specifically as you, were, you worked with us on the farm loans cases where Um, Farmers of a particular race were getting farm loan forgiveness while certain other farmers were not. That was at least congressionally authorized. Congress doesn't have the power to override the Constitution. So those cases uh, all resulted in um, the uh, Department of Agriculture losing. But uh, in addition to that, even after um, Congress stopped authorizing direct race preferences, many of these same agencies continue utilizing them. Um, You and I are both involved in the Strickland matter, which involved disaster relief for farmers. And even though Congress had never done anything other than give a pile of money for Department of Agriculture to give to farmers who are affected by natural disasters, the Department of Agriculture was giving more money to different farmers of a different race for the same amount of loss. And uh, that, of course, runs straight across um, the constitutional requirement of colorblindness. So it doesn't matter whether Congress authorizes it or not. Um, you have a federal government that is currently fully committed to the ideology. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a good point, and I'll just offer one example, which is, uh, you know, May, May and I were both in the Trump administration. While she was in the White House, I was in the Department of Education, and toward the end of our tenure there, we issued guidance on racial issues, saying you can't segregate classrooms by race for the purpose of education. You can't grade differently based on race. You can't do uh, differential training for either teachers or residential assistants in college based on their race. 
And within days of the executive order that you just mentioned, all that guidance was revealed as inconsistent with the notion of equity, which I thought was just stunning. The idea that you would have to repeal guidance that says don't segregate your students by race because it's inconsistent with the notion of equity was really shocking. I think it demonstrates just how committed this administration is to DEI. Now, Braden mentioned that it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, it's a bad idea. May, do you want to talk about maybe how it's dangerous too? I mean, you, uh, yeah. I, Independent Women's Forum is involved in the Secret Service case. It seems like it's really a, posing a danger to to um, the federal government to be embracing these notions. It is so. Um, it's it's dangerous and it's bad for women. Um, well, the the minority group that's that's supposed to be benefited by DEI. So IWF is very excited to be partnering with Mountain States on um, an investigation and ideally litigation where we will challenge the Secret Service's blatant uh, obsession with hitting a 30% women mark for its agents. Um, This is something that uh, Kim Cheadle, who of course uh, came from Pepsi, so she's of DEI world, um, decided that she wanted to hit 30% women, which is something that a lot of different law enforcement agencies have been committing to. Um, And you know what, in a sense, it's, it's fine. We, but the problem is, DEI, as we all know, uh, in, in a, especially in creating a quota system, decides to take, and I hate the word merit sometimes because it's really not about merit. It's it's the best person for the job. It's whoever's going to keep the president, the protected person safe. Take that out of the calculation and put in something completely irrelevant, which is your chromosomes and your genitals, right? So uh, that is what the Secret Service has committed to and other law enforcement agencies. This is dangerous when it is in the Secret Service, but it's dangerous throughout all of these agencies that have taken this 30 by 30 commitment are really endangering communities and in the case of the Secret Service, endangering uh, the pr- the people that they're protecting and they're protecting these people because they're important to our democracy. So they're really endangering the very fabric of our country. I mean, imagine what would happen if pres- if if it was, you know, half a centimeter the other way. Like, it, oh. I don't I don't know where we'd be right now as a country. So um, so we're very excited to try and find, we, well, we know this is happening. The facts are, are not difficult. Uh, we know that there's a quota system. We know that women, uh, uh, Senator Hawley said that he has a whistleblower who has confirmed that uh, women, including those who were assigned to the Butler rally that day, uh, were not qualified, that they had not passed the test that they needed to, and yet they were promoted and and given responsibility that day anyway. Um, So we know what the facts are, but as we all know, you can't just challenge things. We need a plaintiff. So we're, you know, we have a very wide search going. We've got a lot of good leads. All additional leads are, are helpful. And I I guess I will say one other thing um, as the women's organization here, but our quest is not just to get more dudes in the Secret Service. That's (laughs) not very exciting. I mean, that's that's fine. It should have as many dudes as it should have. The quest here is to make sure that all people, including women, including minorities, are respected in the workplace. And when you are a woman in a very male-dominated workplace and you are assumed to be a token hire, uh, that's not that's not great. It makes all of us look bad. It makes all of us look incompetent when something like uh, the Pennsylvania shooting happened or the Pennsylvania assassination attempt happened. So um, that's... I think that's the other focus of ending DEI is to give everybody equal dignity and um, and DEI practices strip people of that. So we're looking we're looking for a plaintiff. Anybody let us know. <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely. And you know, we're excited to work with uh, IWF on that case. Braden, I think this raises an interesting question, which is a lot of the times the critics say, 
Well, all you want to do is protect the majority. You know, maybe you do want more more dudes in the Secret Service, or maybe you aren't adequately accounting for history or Jim Crow or slavery. I mean, there are a lot of excuses as to why people ought to take race or sex into account more. I mean, what what is the answer to that? And obviously, I have I have my own answer. And um, in your work, what do you think the answer to that is when people criticize us for not taking account of history? Well, I mean, uh, there's no doubt that history continues to play a meaningful role um, in uh, differences between different demographic groups. But the solution to that is not to go ahead and repeat the mistakes of the past and begin treating different people differently. The reason why that was wrong is because it was wrong, not because it happened to the wrong people. Um, you know, and as, as Justice Roberts memorably said, you know, the fastest way to, to end discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. I mean, America is a divided place, but it, shockingly, we agree so much on so many issues in private, even if we're reluctant to say so. And so Americans, more so than any point in time in the nation's history, genuinely value diversity. Uh, I think most Americans genuinely want, for lack of a better word, the best man for the job, even if that best man is a woman. Um, but by that same token, all, most Americans continue to believe in a meritocracy and they want a vision of America where Americans are rewarded based on their accomplishments, their hard work, and their natural talents, and not based on um, some innate, innate, inherent character trait. I mean, just to use the example of the Secret Service, and of course, I'm not familiar with the details of whether or not there really was um, standards being set aside, but uh, assuming that there, that there were, that's bad for women, among other people, because there are women that are capable of doing that job and doing it well. And those women have their values or have their accomplishments devalued when they can see other people get rewarded just by virtue of the fact that they are women and um, there's a particular political imperative to try to elevate them to give the appearance of achieving a gender neutral workplace. So um, I, I think that Americans are committed to a diverse and meritocratic version of society and the, the fastest way to start um, overcoming the woeful history of mistreatment amongst particular demographics is to just start looking for opportunities to remove barriers and to do outreach on the individual level. But mo more Americans are willing to do that than ever before. It certainly is not a situation that requires government intervention in 2024. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, May, when people approach the Independent Women's Forum, People assume just reflexively that because it's a, a a group dedicated to the rights of women that they that you must be in favor of DEI or preferences or or something else related to sex. And, and do you get black or uh, you know I don't traitor being traitors for lack of for lack of a better term uh, to the cause of women more generally? And then uh, what is the response? That obviously, those are baseless charges, but I assume you mu you must have had that leveled at you before. Yeah, so we've been pretty active on uh, things like litigation. Um, sorry, I have a dog that's losing its mind, but uh, oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> litigation against um, board requirements that require a certain number of women on boards. Well, why wouldn't you want more women on boards? Well, who actually benefits? more when you have a really good board women do because you that company companies are more profitable and women's 401ks and you know savings go up so everything we're doing is for women but the thing is women are people first we have the same incentives as men or anybody else which is we you know we want to to be well off. We want security. We don't want our presidents to get shot. These types of things. We don't want to be ridiculed at work. We don't want to be treated as tokens. Um, and so I think that that's really the problem that the left has. Is they think that respecting women means treating us as lesser, more inferior, uh, weaker beings, except for when it comes to sports. And then you need to put the <laughs> men in women's sports and women's <laughs> locker rooms. Um, but, but yeah, so that it's the same thing every equal payday we come out and we say 
uh, if you're going to talk about the pay gap, let's talk about why it exists. And so then you can figure out whether it's a problem. I mean, I, I it, the pay gap is a problem if you're taking two equally qualified people and you're saying, hey, woman, oh, there's balloons. Uh, <laughs> Hey woman, you should get paid less because you're a woman. That's that's already illegal under um, federal law and m most state laws. I would assume every state law, but I don't want to speak for every state. So uh, so that's illegal, and that would be a problem, and that would be something we care about. What we wouldn't care about is, hey, I as a woman want to work part time, or I want to work in a job that does not require the mental strain or the physical strain that some types of jobs put on me, because I'd like to take that mental and physical strain and put it into my family or put it into something else. And that that sort of decision should be celebrated in our society. And so this is, again, taking uh, women and saying that we're not going to infantilize them by ridiculing their choices, but giving women the respect that they deserve to say you don't have to profit maximize you can happiness maximize and that's perfectly okay so yeah i i would say that uh for anybody short-sighted it would seem like iwf uh doesn't care about women but if you think one step beyond um obsession over the pay gap or obsession about the number of women on boards and think about what actually makes women happy what really makes women happy i think it's it's not having oh look there's a lot of women on these boards it's having a bank account that can actually pay for groceries that that's much more satisfying to me than that grocery company having two women on its board um, so I mean, we talked a lot about the federal government's obsession uh with dei let's shift gears a little bit and talk about what the response can be from organizations like ours what can we do about it obviously litigation uh, is one path shaming the uh, opportunity activity is another. Um, Braden, turning it over to you. I mean, talked about the disaster relief program a little bit. Um, have you seen successes against the federal government's obsession? And do you anticipate future successes if this continues the way it's been going? Well, yes. Um, I mean, it's very, very hard to defend unequal treatment under the law. Uh, I think I'm struggling to come up with very many examples where the federal government has succeeded under this administration in defending either one of its uh, race or sex preferences, whether that's done by law or regulation. Um, courts are exceptionally skeptical of them. The body of evidence that's being marshaled up by the government of defense is exceptionally weak. I mean, one of the things that courts consider is whether there have been relatively recent efforts to remediate the past effects of um, discrimination. And of course, everybody knows that there have been massive efforts to try to account for actual instances of discrimination uh, at the government's hands at various levels. And so that just makes it very, it, it makes it hard and somewhat ironic that the more we've done to clean up this issue and raise awareness around the issue, the more the government is standing on the gas of trying to dole out these race and sex preferences. Um, and so it's not surprising that they're consistently losing, be it in the context of disaster relief programs or uh, minority preferences for uh, business contracting or health care or uh, farm loan forgiveness or any of the variety of settings in which we, we've seen these things manifest. Um, but, you know, the strategy is, is only reaching limited success precisely because um, there's sort of an attitude of you can't catch them all. Um, and if you if you throw enough stuff out there, a few of them are going to sneak past the goalie and successes, even successes in court are slow to come by. And they're muted by the fact that many judges are reluctant to issue injunctions or orders that bar the government from continuing to do its unlawful conduct that extends past the parties to the litigation. And of course, this goes back to the hubbub surrounding so-called nationwide injunctions. I actually don't like that term. I think it's imprecise, but the point is whether or not courts should be issuing relief to parties who are not before them. 
And uh, the government has latched on to that principle. And so they'll litigate a case for years defending a race preference against all the odds. And then when they lose, they're just told you can't do it against these two particular people. And the next guy who's going to be injured by the same program essentially has to start from square zero. So that's been a real problem for those of us who litigate these kind of cases. Um, and I think it's emboldening uh, the willingness of the other side to continue to do these things, even though I'm confident that their own internal legal memorandums suggest that they're highly unlikely to uh, succeed in court. Yeah, I mean, uh, I completely agree with them. I'll uh, avoid mentioning uh, Pokemon and got, whether you can catch them all. But the... Um, the you must have kids. <laughs> the trend that you're talking about is absolutely true. And, and, you know, it's becoming more brazen, actually, in my opinion. So Mountain States Legal has a case we haven't talked about yet called Brigida, where we represent over 900 would-be air traffic controllers who apply during the Obama administration. You may have mentioned that a lot of this happened for the first time under President Obama. Uh, and this case has been going since 2015 because they've dug in. So it's a class action case. We fought over class action. We fought over a motion to dismiss. We fought over discovery. And literally, we're nine years into this case because the lawyers at the Department of Justice have decided that this is a priority uh, and that they aren't going to give up because if they give up here, it could set a bad precedent for other diversity programs. So in that case, in Brigida, where you know, we hope to get a resolution in the next year or two, you can see how long it can take to fight back against some of the federal government's obsession with DEI and prioritizing it, making it hard to settle those cases. We talked a little bit about the private sector and the, the private sector has different incentives. This is a class action where we've survived a motion to dismiss. We're in the middle of discovery. You would think if this were a private employer, they would have settled this case a long time ago, but the incentives are quirky when you're the federal government and it's not your money you're fighting with. May I'll ask the same question to you in terms of uh, what we can do in response to the uh, obsession with DEI at the federal level, uh, in terms of litigation, in terms of shaming the federal government, uh, maybe other tools that there might be, like commenting on proposed rules. Uh, what sorts of things do you see in the, the toolbox for responding to this obsession? Yeah, so I guess I'll I'll answer as a former Fed. Um, what are the things that stopped us from doing what we wanted to do? Um, and it oftentimes was litigation. The state of California, this is uh, former Attorney General Becerra, who's now the head of HHS, bragged that he sued the Trump administration more than 100 times. It's one state suing a, a president more than 100 times. Of course, you know, some of that is joining on with other states, but this is a real dedication of resources from the left. And you know what? A lot of things that we wanted to do were paused. And so I think it it has to be litigation, which is why it's so important for us to try and find uh, people who are willing to speak out. It's really tough to find plaintiffs, especially in law enforcement, because you are benefited, you are uh, rewarded in law enforcement for keeping your head down and just, you know, paying attention to yourself. You might have not gotten the promotion. It might have been on race. It might have been on sex. But as long as you keep your head down and work, 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 there's this idea that things are going to work out. I don't know if that's right anymore. And so I think that that mentality has to shift, but that mentality hasn't shifted yet. So one, I do agree it has to be litigation. But two, uh, I think constant drum drumbeat in the media a lot of uh, times, and this I think is partnering with litigation, but judges are human too. So judges are going to, I think, be a little bit more willing to let DEI go so long as there's a positive conception of it. Oh, it's not really racism. Oh, it's rooted in history. You know, all of these things, you, you really do have to turn the tide on the culture before I think a judge is going to be bold enough to side. And I, I, that's what the left was so great at. Um, we had the same immigration uh proposals as Biden, you know, like remain in Mexico, various things. But for us, it was kids in cages. And for them, it's not. It's not. And and so for us, it, we were enjoined. And for them, well, they they've, you know, every time they propose these things, the ACLU says, I think I'm going to challenge you. And then they sort of never get around to it. So <laughs> uh, so so trying to figure out 
ways to continue to talk to the media. Um, I know it's difficult in this political landscape where all anybody wants to talk about is the polls, but um, every opportunity to frame DEI as what it is, which is infantilizing minorities, uh, women, you know, favored groups, and uh, as bad, not just illegal, but as bad, um, I think is is necessary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the Bridgetta case, we've been talking about not just the fact that it's illegal to hire air traffic controllers based on race, but exceedingly dangerous. Um, and we've talked about the risks um, to a president or a presidential candidate if you don't have the best person for the job on the Secret Service. But imagine, God forbid, you know, something happened in aviation because of DEI hiring at the FAA and what a disaster that would be for Americans and consumer confidence in the aviation industry. And it is truly dangerous to embrace uh, these aggressive racial preferences. Well, we do have some questions flowing in, which I do want to get to in one minute. Um, I'll pose one last question to uh, Braden and May. Braden, are, are you seeing the federal government's attitude trickle down? Um, we talked about the private sector a little bit, and maybe state governments or local governments. Are you seeing other really um, objectionable trends at the state or local level because they're taking their cues from the federal government? Well, I mean, it, it's hard for them to get away with it in Tennessee just because um, our state is uh, our state government is not likely to let those things go. Um, however, you know, we, I, we still see it in the educational setting, school boards, um, and sometimes in local government. I mean, and you, you can see things like minority preferences in airport vendors um, or, you know, some of the, the stereotyping in, um, about, about racial groups having a privilege or being oppressors being taught in some of the schools and school settings with educators being forced to do things like privilege walks. We see some excuse me, some of that. Um, and then, of course, there are some legacy programs that have been around for a long time that I don't know that have been updated to reflect uh, developments in Supreme Court law. You know, there's there's still things like um, resources that are being offered uh, for um, scholarship money that are entirely based on race, those kind of things. Um, but it's not as big of an issue uh, in Tennessee as I suspect it is in other places. But still an issue. Yeah. May, uh, Braden raised an interesting point about how people might be embracing things uh, at the state and local level, probably not in Tennessee. And, and interestingly, um, in Colorado, they embrace very aggressive DEI training, uh, including in one of our cases involving a prison guard, after President Trump uh, prohibited uh, through, execu through executive order a lot of the most aggressive forms of uh, racialized. Uh, HR training at the federal level, so Colorado embraced it. Um, you want to talk about the interaction between the federal government and the state or local governments or schools um, and what you're seeing in terms of whether there's a trickle-down effect or maybe a reverse trickle-down effect? Yeah, um, so oh, to the extent these laws exist, which they shouldn't exist, but you would think that they actually should be at the state level and not at the federal level. And yet the federal government tries to assert its uh, DEI authority, including through federal contractor mandates, which was, uh, you know, the, one of the ways they pushed the VAX mandate on individual employers. You've got to get your uh, workforce vaccinated. So, you know, the idea that there is an affirmative action requirement coming out of the federal government, especially coming out of the president, um, not even Congress, is pretty offensive and yet uh, seems to be fairly effective because a lot of uh, bad ideas that we see coming out of the federal government do trickle down to, to the state level. Um, you know, what are what are the trends that we see going on in the states? I think they're probably all over the place. But in general, people are attracted to wanting to campaign on helping people. And there's just something that feels good about the word equity and wanting, you know, <laughs> people to 
feel as though this is somehow non-discrimination, that affirmative action is the same thing as non-discrimination. So I think you end up seeing states that you would assume are conservative actually embracing more DEI policies. And, you know, I lived in Ohio, so I'm just speaking. Ohio is probably a leftist state that somehow votes for Trump, but uh, like a pro-union worker, like these types of things. So not every state that you would think actually has, and even Colorado is supposed to have libertarian, you know, it's a libertarian <laughs> state. And all of a sudden now you've got CRT training uh, required. So I, I think that you're not going to see leadership from the states necessarily. I think you're going to see a little bit of following and cowardice. And what you actually do need to see is leadership at the federal government saying, we're not doing this, this is bad. And then you'll see the states follow. But to have a random, you know, attorney general or governor candidate take a stand that seems, that feels to be anti-woman or anti-minority, it's just unlikely. You need, you need, I think, federal leadership to say, cut this out, guys. It's illegal and it's bad. Well, let's get to our questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, you can drop it in the Q&A box on your screen. We do already have a couple of questions, so if you want to get a question asked, you should uh, put it in soon. The first question uh, touches on something, May, that you said uh, about infantilizing or demeaning people who are the beneficiaries of racial preferences or sex preferences. Uh, this person asks, um, what is it about the idea of DEI that makes people think that it's beneficial for either racial minorities or women to have weaker standards or lesser standards? And is there an opportunity for someone who is the victim of that to bring litigation? So I suppose an example might be, uh, you know, an African-American uh, employee who says, I don't want to be thought of as lesser and the DEI measure makes me or stigmatizes me in the workplace or with the federal benefit program. So for either of you, I'd be curious if you think that there might be litigation based on stigma or some other um, atmospheric harm that comes from being the beneficiary of a DEI program, or is that you know two or three steps down the road? And for now, it's going to be mostly the person who is disadvantaged more directly by the DEI program. Braden or May, do you want to start? You go ahead and start, May. I'll, I'll chime in. Yeah, well, if we were leftist organizations, I would say that's absolutely a harm, but standing has been difficult for conservative organizations to establish. And I guess my fear with a, you have hired me with a badge of inferiority, um, as your theory of standing, while, you know, maybe it should be tested out, I think that type of stigmatic injury is sort of the, a standard, this is not going to count as sufficiently concrete. Um, and, you know, you need to show that you were harmed dollar amount wise, you didn't get the job, that there was something that you can see and count and it wasn't, as you say, sti stigmatic harm. Um, but if you could connect that stigmatic injury with something that did qualify, so maybe something along the lines of um, because you were hired with this badge of inferiority, therefore, with clients, you don't have as many opportunities or there, you know, that 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 itself, that badge of inferiority is then connected to something that is tangible that you can see and, and feel and you and it doesn't feel hypothetical. It feels real. That, I think, is something. But I think that bridge is what you're going to need to establish. Yeah, that's a good point. Braden, yeah, do you want I to think add anything? I, no, I agree 100%. I mean, the Supreme Court has recognized stigmatic injuries as flowing from these sorts of things. But it's kind of really tightened up on that in recent decades. I do think you need stigma plus something else. And the way May has outlined it, I think, is pretty much on point. You need to have to show how, how the stigma has tangibly affected your work environment or your educational environment. Then you might have something. Next question is about why is the obsession over disparities per se? So the questioner says, you know, 97% of uh, garbage men, I guess I'll say garbage people, uh, all happen to be male, uh, but no one's really concerned about needing to get to 50-50 in that context. Uh, I suppose you might say that there's a disproportionate 
number of female teachers or nurses or uh, I'm sure there are other professions. Why is there concern about numbers uh, when people talk about DEI? Um, well, Braden, yeah. if you want to go first and talk about what the maybe the legal ramifications of statistical disparities are. Well, I mean, that's the problem with with equity as we've formulated it and disparate impact is it posits that the only possible reason why there's ever a disparity between men and women or black people and white people is because of racism or sexism. When in fact, it just discounts a whole host of other reasons that might be totally innocuous for why people make different choices. I mean, I, the nurse example is a great example, but you know, for there's reams of social data that just show that women are more drawn to that profession. And in many cases, men are drawn to more risk-taking uh, risk-taking professions that lend themselves to greater rewards if they pay off. And that's why, you know, much about the much ballyhoo gender gap disappears if you equalize between sexes within an industry. It's less about the fact that there's discrimination and more about the fact that that for whatever reason, men are drawn to more high paid professions and women are drawn to more secure professions like nursing. And so it does flatten everything in a way that I think is harmful and also inaccurate. Um, people make different choices and, you know, there are different characteristics between um, the sexes. Uh, I don't think I'm breaking uh, science here by by pointing that out. Yeah. Okay, do you it's tough because, you know, in in an ideal environment, what would be the right percentage of garbage women, right? What would be the right percentage of Secret Service ladies? What would be the right number of male nurses? Like any number you pick is going to be arbitrary, and that's the problem with quotas. But does that mean you have to absolutely not think about diversity? And when I, like, I don't, in a sense, sometimes diversity is a good thing in that, uh, you know, you don't always have to hang out with everybody who's exactly like you. Maybe your neighbors went to an SEC school and you went to the <laughs> Big 12. Like, you, it, it, diversity is fine. And you can't have, and if there are structural things that you have, so I'm a, a nursing mom and I would prioritize going to a workplace uh, that allowed for that. And so I think that if companies feel as though, for whatever reason, they want to be a friendlier environment to women, that's, I think, an appropriate thing to think about. And it's appropriate thing to remedy, which is like, we do have this extra room, we probably could, uh, like, make it more friendly for nursing. How about it? This is great. And like, and then you can organically care about women more, accommodate women more, have happier women in your workplace. And so that's the problem with the quota and trying to figure out what's the pr proper number of garbage women versus, I think, actually, what can make women ha happy? What can make people happy? What can make a more productive working environment? And I think that latter conversation is the one that you end up not having when all you have is a quota system, because then you're just shoveling women into garbage things rather than thinking, you know, what about my workplace could make people happier? I think that is such an excellent point. I mean, it, that's what I that goes to what I was referring to earlier when I said like remove barriers. That's a great way of of achieving it. There's no particular reason why the workplace needs to be set a particular way. But, um, you know, as a person who has a lot of strong women in their life, a lot of the ways that we just naturally set up a workplace are designed to exclude women as they move through life. And it's not a big ask to just make some accommodations like, you know, flexible work hours are a great way of opening the door to more people um, because not everybody is set up on the model where, you know, dad walks out in a suit at 7 a.m. and he comes back at 6.30 and his wife hands him a martini and he's got somebody handling childcare all day long. But, you know, that's the way that the, the workplace was set up for a long time, but it doesn't have to be that way. And just by making those simple alterations, like what May referred to, is a great way of making the workplace more accessible to a greater number of people. I think there's a lot of opportunities to do those kind of things. Yeah, well, it's port wine in my house, not a martini, but thank you. Uh, no, I'm... I'm Connie, I'm, red, Ellen, white, watching, tell us, so well. true, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, last question. I'm embarrassed I didn't ask this. Uh, 
didn't Harvard make all this? Didn't the Harvard case that the Supreme Court decided last year make all this illegal? Why are we still talking about DEI anywhere, uh, given that affirmative action has been uh, declared unconstitutional or a violation of Title VI? Um, yeah. It, go ahead, Braden. It didn't. Yeah. It just said that what Harvard d- was doing wasn't wasn't good enough to justify its discrimination. It continued to reaffirm that there's instances when um, it is legitimate for the government to engage in some form of discrimination, but it just took pains to emphasize that the government has a really high standard of proving that it needs to resort to those means, and Harvard hadn't done it. Um, and unfortunately, r- rather than causing a whole host of governmental actors and people in higher education to reevaluate to see if they really, really needed to resort to education. They took that as something of a permission structure to be like, unlike Harvard, we really, really do need it. Or we can go ahead and start concocting the evidentiary showing that we would need to produce if we were ever challenged just by taking note of what Harvard failed to do in their case. So unfortunately, there's a long fight left to go. Um, But, I mean, I do think this is one where we can take a little heart in the fact that, like, Americans remain stubbornly committed to the principles of equality and colorblindness and have never liked race preferences, even when they're given innocuous labels like affirmative action. And that has just been a durable principle that no amount of propaganda has been able to undo. May, what about the the Harvard decision? Has, Has it affected your work? Has it interacted with anything uh, that you're involved with in terms of sex preferences. Obviously, Harvard's about the racial preferences and affirmative action. Has it come? Uh, has it come into play at IWF? Um, so it hasn't yet. Um, although I do think um, there's some language about the difference between constitutional requirements and strictly interpreting. Uh, Title VI and I think Title VII, which are uh, rules against non uh, rules against discrimination on colleges and in workplaces, where we're fighting gender ideology and people are trying to extract constitutional requirements of gender ideology because you've got language um, in Title VII that's that says you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. So minus the difference between uh, statutory and constitutional requirements. It hasn't yet, but I do think um, I do think it will because, you know, the, the whole idea of the Harvard case was the Supreme Court has always said that you may not constitutionally discriminate on the basis of sex unless you have a really good reason. And so it used to be a really good reason to say I like diversity in colleges, but they've never said I like diversity is fine in the workplace. So in a sense, the workplace is already now where colleges are. Now they're the same, where that's no longer a really good reason. And so I think now colleges and the workplace are in are going forth into the new world together, which is, is there another thing that's a good enough reason? Um, Or was the Supreme Court actually serious when they said that uh, affirmative action racial discrimination is unconstitutional? Like, were they serious about that? Because the Supreme Court never actually had to be serious about that top line message because you had a backdoor saying, unless you had a really good reason. So now that that backdoor is gone, does the Constitution actually prohibit uh, affirmative action, Supreme Court, ready, go? And I think that there are a lot of different ways that it can address that, whether that's the West Point carve out, whether that's, uh, you know, really digging into what schools are doing, whether that's the workplace. But there's a lot of litigation left to go. Yeah, well, on, on that inspirational and hopeful note, I think we'll close up. Thank you to our terrific commentators today, May Mamlin with the Independent Women's Forum, uh, le- um, legal uh, group and Braden Busek, the Vice President of Litigation uh, with the Southeastern Legal Foundation, both terrific partners of Mountain States Legal Foundation doing incredible work. Uh, you can check them out at their websites and you can check out uh, MSLF at mslegal.org. Uh, stay tuned for information about our October webinar in the So a Neighbor Asked series. And with that, thank you to all of our guests, all of our questioners, and of course, again, our amazing. Uh, commentators. We'll see you next month.